All right. You may remember when we went out to the hall yesterday where we looked at our list of the must-have priority standards, the, like the things for geometry that we absolutely need. Do any of you remember what the number one thing on that list was right up at the top of the list? <coughs> First thing on that list was vocabulary. You knew what the words were and you could use them. That's our primary objective for today. With this video that we've got, we have geometry congruence standard number one. And standard number one is basically, I know what this stuff is. I know some vocabulary and I know how to use it. So that's what this particular video is about. We're looking at it and simply saying, here are a lot of words. We want to make sure you know what they are. We want to make sure you know what they look like, how to write them down. And so we're launching into that. Now, I don't expect you to write all of these things down. Um, I just would like to note, here are a lot of the vocabulary that we are going to use throughout this particular one, uh, throughout this uh, video. Now, some of the most basic things in geometry are undefined terms. Basically, they're things that you know what they are and you don't need to go out and write out what they are. For instance, what is a point? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of people just like, kind of pointing in like that little dot. Yeah, you know what a point is. A couple thousand year, years ago, there was a mathematician that described it officially as that which has no parts. Don't you love the textbook definition for that? A point is that which has no parts. Well, we don't really need to know the definition. We know what it is. And so it's an undefined term. And this is another thing that I don't expect you to have written down, but we just kind of want to run through them. We know what a point is. It's the single little dot here. We know what a line is. What's a line? A line is going to go through two points, and it has that double-sided arrow. So it goes on forever in both directions. The main thing I want to focus on here is how to name the line. We have two different ways of naming lines. One way is to use the points that they go through. When we look at this picture, we can see that we have the point x, and we have the point Y. And so to name the line, all we have to do is draw the line on top of it. That's the line XY. We just draw what we have. It's also really common to use cursive letters. Like when you look over here, we have the cursive letter L. We could just say it's line L. We sometimes will use numbers also. We can have a number there and simply say that is line number one. Planes work the same way. To create a plane, or what's a plane? It's a flat space. Like the board, like the floor, like the ceiling. You've got a flat space that goes on forever in any, all those directions. Well, to name one, we could do it by using three points say plane A, B, C, because those are three points that are all on the same flat surface. Sometimes an easier way is, again, to use a cursor. You see down here in the corner how we've got this little cursive or script R? A lot of times we'll just use that. This is plane R with a cursive type style. Really quick way to refer to them then. Moving forward. Here's a term that you may not be familiar with. Collinear. What does collinear mean? Well, of course, our textbook definition is point, three points are collinear if they all fall on the same line. Fantastic. What does that mean? More simply, collinear just means they're all in a row. If you have three points that are all in a row, they're collinear. You'd be able to put all of them and draw a line through each of them. And so that line, this definition of collinear, although it's important, it's not going to play as big a role for us as the next <coughs> one. Coplanar is a term that we definitely need to know. What does coplanar mean? Well, I'd like to make an observation here. If you look at the middle of collinear, we have co, 
linear. And it means they're all in the same line. So, so planar, they're all in the same plane. So we've got three points, four points, maybe some lines, but things are coplanar if they're all in the same flat surface. Looking over at the marker board here, I could draw a couple of points, and I know that those three points are coplanar because they're all on the same flat surface. They're on the marker board. If I take the tip of my marker, I can create a fourth point. Say we've got one, two, three, and the tip of my marker is now point number four. Those are not coplanar. Because can we take all four of those points and put them on the same flat surface? Not going to work. We can't do it. So those are non coplanar. You will need to know what coplanar means. It's nice to know collinear. I don't want you to draw the picture. I don't want you to go all these pieces. I want your brains active, not your pens active. Looking at the picture, let's start by identifying four coplanar points. Remember, what does coplanar mean? All on the same plane, so on the same flat surface. Where are they? All right, and it's almost like a monk chant going on there, A, B, C, D. Sweet. Let's move on and find three lines. Okay, so we were given ET. Thank you, Gurney. And how do I write out the line, though? Absolutely. We want to remember to draw that. So we have the line ET connecting the two points and, connect and continuing double-sided arrow on both sides because it does not stop. <laughs> Let's get some others. AE, okay, so if we said AE, that's taking us from point A up to point E. And we do have the double sided arrow continuing. Yeah, DE would be a third one. From D and E connecting there. What did you say, Steven? Mm -hmm. BE would be a fourth line. That is also correct. I'd like to bring up an idea here, or rather just ask you a question. What if I flip the order on this so that. Okay. Why is it the same line? Why is, why is it the same, or why is it one? Let's, let's investigate that. It doesn't matter what comes first. Okay, why not? Journey, Journey is saying it doesn't matter which one's first. Why not? Because the line is going to be the same thing. Yeah, because when we're looking at them, you, you guys, you have it. You've got it nailed. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if we're starting and continuing that way and that way, or if I draw it backwards and say go down and over, it's still falling on top of itself. It is the same line. I don't expect you to memorize this term. This is a piece that's called the symmetric property. The symmetric property lets you flip around the order of these letters. No, I'm sorry. The commutative property, since we're not dealing with a congruence relationship. <coughs> All right, let's continue with this. Using the image, find two planes. Awesome. All right, we've got that one quickly. And then we've got this plane R right here. And there's an other one that is spitting out at me. Yeah. We've got A connecting to B, connecting to C. And I've got it drawn as a triangle, not like this rectangle thing. So what is, does that mess us up? Yeah. yeah, they're still no. flat. We can still extend them outward. It's just like we're extending it outward, extending it outward, and outward, and outward. It's still going to be the same flat surface. It doesn't have to be drawn as a parallelogram to be a plane. As long as it's a flat surface, we've got it. And we only need three points to make sure we, we have it. So we can write this out precisely as you told me, plane ABC. Okay, I do not expect you to write all of these pieces down, but these are things that you should know. What is a segment? Okay, what's the distinguishable characteristic of a segment? 
Earlier, we had a line where we've got the double-sided arrow. Basically, this segment chops off the ends so that it ends at a point. And to be a segment, we actually have to chop off both sides so that we have endpoints on both sides. Well, how would we write this one out then? What kind of symbol would we use? Same thing that we had before. Instead of having a line AB, you've got AB because it's still going through those two points, but you just draw what you've got on top. AB. And that's the exact same thing as if we flipped it around because in both instances they still stop. Correct. You would not use arrows if you're referring to a segment. Just the two points because they do end. When we look at this, this is telling us there is an endpoint on A, it stops, and we have an endpoint on B, so it stops there. We're going to draw the behavior that we have. And that's exactly the same thing that we would do in the third one with a ray. The way this is drawn here, we can see it stops on R, passes through S, and continues onward, so we would draw it RS, and we can see we have the endpoint on the R and the arrow going past the S. We're drawing what we have. This is one that we have to be careful about, though. With lines, it doesn't matter what the first letter is. With segments, it doesn't matter what the first letter is. It's, we can flip them around and it's the same. But think about this one now. What's the same? What's different? The behavior is changing on this one. This is telling us the point stops. There's an endpoint at S, and the ray is continuing past the R. That would be saying endpoint on the S continuing past the R. Are the yellow and blue the same picture? No. No, we've completely reversed the direction on this. We are not allowed to flip around the order of points on a ray. It does change what we're doing. We've got to be careful about that. Last one on here, what are opposite rays? We'll just stop here for a second and think, what does the word opposite mean? <clears throat> no, RS and SR are not opposite rays. I'll discuss why in just a second. What does the word opposite mean? Not just different, but just like completely different. Not a little bit, but completely. Well, opposite rays are going in completely different directions. We would have this one down here, where starting here we have the ray ED going to the right, and have one that's going in completely the opposite. What's completely the opposite of right? We'd have to go to the left. And so we're looking at this and taking them, the yellow, and the red are opposite rays. Opposite rays we need to have one thing in common though. Please notice that they're joined at the same point in the middle. That's why the SR ray and the RS ray are not considered opposite because we can see there's this section here where they're overlapping. Opposite rays are joined at a common endpoint, but they don't overlap on top of each other. Right, so the question got raised on this bottom one, and I'm still not quite sure what you're asking, and so I'm kind of investigating a little bit. But you commented that we would have the ray from F going through G. Okay, that is a ray. It absolutely is. And we can change the directions and go from G over to the other side. Those are still not opposite rays because we can once again see that there's this overlapping region. Is that what you were referring to? Now, if we wanted to, we could describe other ones 
And if we were looking for opposite rays, we've got this one in the red, we could then stop here with the blue and go to the left. The red and the blue are opposite rays. And so we could describe this as the ray FG. That's true. But we don't have a good way of naming the one on the left because we've got the point F, but then what does it go to? We don't have any other point there named. And so we can't really name this too well. That's why we weren't using it. If we needed to do that for some reason, we could make up a point and say this is the point M. Just make up a letter. That way we could actually give it a name. Those would be opposite rays. Is that what you were asking about? Yeah. Okay. Okay, continuing forward, let's get some drawings. What does a segment with endpoints M and N look like? Uh, endpoint on both sides. Okay, so. So it's like M and N. There, we've got it. Describe what you just told me. No arrows, though, because the endpoints tell us the behavior stops. Let's look at the second one opposite rays with a common endpoint T. It's really, really common for people to draw rays and segments just completely flat, like I had done here. The MN is just flat and horizontal. There is nothing that says we have to do our drawings this way. If we wanted to draw them vertically, standing straight up and down, we can't. It takes up more space, so usually, usually people don't do it. But if we wanted to, we could absolutely draw opposite rays. There is a common endpoint of T, and it does not have to be flat. You can have slanted rays, you can have them perfectly vertical, and in fact, when you wind up taking physics, you will work with a topic called vectors. You'll probably even start touching on them in physical science. But when you work with vectors, it's pretty common to draw rays showing direction and length. And it's very easy to have slanted vectors. So this, this topic you will cycle back to if you wind up taking anything with physics. You'll do a lot with vectors in physics. You might touch on them a bit with physical science, depending on how your instructor sets up the class. All right, now let's get this one drawn. Draw a label with a ray with an endpoint of M that contains N. What's that going to look like? A ray with an endpoint of M containing point N. Okay, so what I was hearing right away is we're going to start by drawing our ray, so we've got the point and the line part. Now what? Okay, somewhere in the middle we've got another point, and where do we label them? N is on the left. N is on the other one. Why not have N on the left? Yeah, if we put this N here, that would mean the end point would be N, but that's not what we were asked to do. We were asked to have the end point of M, which is why we put this. Which is what, oh man. Okay, let me erase that better. Which is why we put that end point there. Don't expect you to have this written down. It's just a term that we'll use. A postulate is something that we accept as true without proof. Here's a really simple example. Let's say I take this desk together and this desk and I slide them together. I make the claim that if I put these two desks together, it's going to be the same length as two desks. So I'm claiming desk plus desk equals two desks. Do you need me to actually move them to believe it? Yep. No, I'm just kidding. That's a postulate. Usually, postulates are things that are so obviously true, you don't request or need any proof. Three really famous postulates we've got are pretty straightforward. I have two points. How many lines can I draw through them? Why only one? Well, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And See, because that connects two points. Why doesn't that work? 
straight. Why isn't it aligned with it? There you go. Lines have to be straight, and when I draw this curve, it's not aligned. Do we really need more proof? This, by the way, is, is an argument, but it's not a proof. This is something that we're going to accept because it's so obviously true. We don't need to have some big, long explanation. We're okay with that. Well, what about here? If I take three points, how many flat surfaces can I put through three points? Right now, I've got the board itself as one flat surface containing all three. What if I were to remove this one and instead take the tip of my marker out here in front, in front of the board? How many planes are going to go through point one, point two, and point three? Just one. Just one. What I would have to do, and people watching the video at home, it's going to be tough to visualize this. I could take my marker board, and if I rotate it along that line, if I start spinning it here, I could take it, the board, and start spinning it outward, and eventually it's going to come out enough that it's going to catch the tip of my marker board. That's the plane. I can rotate it outward and get one plane to come out and connect. Could I rotate the board any other way besides just this one to get it out of a flat surface? Nope. The only way I can connect those three is by rotating the board and wherever it stops, it stops. That's the only way to do it. That's the second postulate. We accept it as being true. Now the third one, if we can, uh, have a point, if we have a, uh, a flat surface like here, so my marker, my board is the plane, and I already know that this point in the red is on this line. The points that are on the line are also points in the plane. You'll buy it. You need proof of it? That's a postulate. It's like saying, if you are inside the Newtown High School, and Newtown High School is in North Dakota, you are also in North Dakota. Do you need proof of that? No. That's what this piece is doing. Okay, so let's run through here. What's the line that passes through these two points? How do you name it? Okay, I've been told X, Y. And because we want the line, we draw the line. We're done. Right? Name a plane that contains three non-collinear points. Remember, non-collinear is saying not in a row. So what plane do we have that does not have three lines in a row? Okay, if we're taking point F, we need three points to define a plane. So what other points do we have? <coughs> FHG. That works. We can simply say plane FHG. We have three points. Not all three points are on the same line, so that's non-collinear. That's perfect. We nailed it. We could have also done it by, how, what's the other way of naming a plane? We've got that cool little cursor. That's plain R. We could have done it that way also. I do not expect you to write this stuff down. Is it Since you're, um, because you are in geometry, I know that all of you have already taken uh, Algebra 1. Do you remember when you were working in Algebra 1, you had a system of equations where you could take two lines and you'd graph them. And wherever they cross, that's where your answer was. That's familiar, right? Okay, lots of heads nodding. This point was a point of intersection. You can even think of this as when you're driving. What do you call two roads that cross? It's an intersection. Same thing as driving. Well, I'd like to ask, what happens 
if you start crossing or intersecting lines and planes. What happens if you cross a plane with a plane? If we have two lines that cross, so line one crossing or intersecting line two, how many points do they cross at? That's postulate four. Do we need proof of that? Okay, if we intersect two planes, and here I want you to start thinking. Look up at the ceiling. The ceiling can be our plane. If we imagine extending in all these directions. This wall over here is another plane. Two flat surfaces, and they do cross. Where are they crossing? They're not crossing at two points. And now you guys get to laugh at me because this is going to be really weird because I'm not tall enough to be able to pull it off. But right up here, think they're crossing there. All the way down, what do we wind up getting? From one all the way over. Where are they actually crossing? It's the whole line. Are they crossing at two lines? No, they can only cross at that one line. Wherever the, that crease is, that's the line we're looking at. This is our postulate five. If, if they cross at all, they cross in one line. Because we know that we could have the floor and the ceiling, which don't cross at all. We could have parallel planes. We could have parallel lines that don't cross. Now, another part that you're probably familiar with. Now, in your previous classes, I'm sure you've seen pieces where we've had boxes drawn like this. And there's a convention that mathematicians tend to follow. When you are working with pieces, we understand that you can't actually see through a box. Now, maybe if it's made out of glass, you could see through it or something, but in general, you can't see through stuff. And yet, we want to be able to see that behavior. So, I'm sure you've seen it before, but I don't know if anyone has specifically said this is why we do it. When we start showing behavior that you wouldn't actually be able to see, we actually want to use a dotted line. With a dotted line, we're looking at things. We can't actually see it, but that behavior is going on anyway. And this is particularly helpful because we can look at pieces and say, for instance, sketch two lines intersecting in exactly one point. Okay, that's fairly quick. Taking what you told me, cross those lines, there we go. For the second one, sketch a figure that shows a line that lies in a plane. Okay, if we were going to take that, we could take the plane and draw it out. Usually people like to draw planes as parallelograms, but it's not necessary. And to have a line that falls in the plane, we just have to draw it out so that it looks like this. Remember, the plane, like the line, extends off in every single direction. But I would like to ask a third question. What if the, we change the problem so that instead of having the line in the plane, it actually punctures a hole? If we have a line going through the plane, if you think almost like the sphere stabbing through the ceiling, what's it going to look like? Okay, that's a situation where we know we'll wind up having a plane thinking of our ceiling. And we know that we'd be able to look down and see like a sphere going through, but we can't actually see through what the ceiling is. And so there's behavior on the other side. There's more of the sphere there. How would we draw the plane or the line going through the plane? Where's that other side? That's an instance where we would then start showing that behavior based on a dotted line. That type of picture is exactly what we need here. Sketch a figure that shows two lines intersecting in one point of a plane. Because they're intersecting in only one point, and only one of the lines is inside the plane, what we're looking at is having the plane drawn. And now go back over the problem and think of it. One of the lines is in the plane. 
So we could draw the plane going through here, or the line inside the plane. And it's dark because you can see the entire behavior. We also need the line to intersect, but it's not in the plane. So this is one that would have to go upward, and it could continue underneath with the dotted line. That finishes off this particular video. All we're doing is looking at some of the behavior going on with points, lines, and planes.